very much, Diana, and, and thank you all for having us here today. I think, you know, a, a particular challenge with a panel like this, uh, each of whom would speak on the topic by themselves for a good long period of time, um, to, to sort of condense the discussion into, into the, the time that we've got. But I think one of the really important things uh, to note is that, you know, each of us up here has been focusing on U.S. energy security and environmental challenges in one form or another for a, a long period of time. And it's a tremendously dynamic environment. Um, I feel like for the past several, you know, a decade or so, we've gone after revolution after revolution in the energy sector. Things always shifting, whether it's uh, uh, demand surprises from China, uh, or climate change challenges, or uh, most recently the unconventional revolution, we're always sort of experiencing these dynamic shifts in the energy market, which is so very fundamental to global economic and national security, and, and certainly U.S. national security. So there's no doubt that a, a group uh, as global well aware as yourselves have, have identified U.S. Uh, energy security and, and, and environmental challenges as a, as a core issue to be focused on. So I'm very pleased to be able to uh, help facilitate that discussion today. In the interest of time, I thought maybe what we could do is, is sort of talk about the shifting landscape uh, that's out there for U.S. energy security and, and perhaps start uh, with uh, uh, with John Hockmeister, who actually was in the industry for a while and is very attuned to uh, some of the, the big challenges or changes that have, and opportunities that have been taking place specifically within the United States over the last several years. Um, how, how do you view you know, what this sort of, especially on the unconventional side, what, what's happening out there and what it means for the United States? If, if anything, the size and the scale of the transformation is understated, woefully understated, because it's very difficult for the human mind to wrap itself around the incredible volume and mass of energy in the ground in this country, as well as, and at the same time as, the energy in, in, in that's in, in the atmosphere, so sun, solar, and so forth. I make the point that the energy transformation of the 21st century could drive five plus percent GDP growth for most of this century. And that the economic conversion from stale growth, slow growth, to more rapid growth to accommodate a larger population in this country is woefully under, under uh, just not well known. And we have to get the message out because we're holding ourselves back. Unfortunately, the politics of energy is destroying the energy future of the country. Whereas the technology and the economics could be the bounty that the nation needs to capture. Particularly in this dimension. We have been stuck on oil for a very long time. But for all the additional oil we could possibly drill, it doesn't solve the problem of oil as a transportation fuel when oil is ultimately and will continue to be managed by a cartel called OPEC. And the price is artificially set by OPEC for their own cartel reasons. And there isn't going to be enough oil to ever overcome the effects of that cartel. Therefore, the transformation that is the largest in this country in the short and medium term, and I'm talking out 25 to 30 years short and medium term, is the opportunity for natural gas to dramatically change transportation fuel in this country. Why not have competitive fuels? We have competitive beverages in the convenience stores at the gas stations. Why don't we have competitive fuels at the, at the pump where we could have compressed natural gas, we could have liquefied natural gas, we could turn natural gas into methanol, treat it just like ethanol, mix it with gasoline to greatly reduce the foreign imports of oil in this country. There's a transformation not yet happening that could affect every citizen's pocketbook in a favorable way, and it's a cleaner fuel at the same time. I'll leave it there. Great. Well, so a, a revolution that, that is underappreciated and, and yet to sort of fulfill its full promise in terms of uh, making uh, market impact. So, so from, from the work that we do, oftentimes we're looking at sort of how a lot of what's happening, especially on the unconventional oil and gas side here in the United States, which has shifted this idea of uh, energy scarcity in the United States, so perhaps one of energy abundance or of energy self-sufficiency, is really something that's happening in the marketplace. That's something that policymakers are absorbing and, and, and 
middle, I wanted to talk from your perspective of you know, looking at the history of U.S. energy policy and, and what does this mean for people who are looking at the policy options that need to happen vis-a-vis uh, -vis energy security in the United States? How are people absorbing these changes and, and, and what do you see uh, as a significant for them? Well, thank you, and I agree with, with you and John. This is, is a revolution happened with gas shale, let me say, what did we do right in the last 40 years? Because if we just kind of follow what we did right in the last 40 years, if we've learned a lot of lessons, good and bad, I think that will be very good and pointing towards the future. Um, first, let me say, entrepreneurship of the small oil and gas man, I'm delighted that Shell and BP and Chevron and all of you are supporting this effort, but frankly speaking, the entrepreneurship in the, of the small guy, the independent, who first discovered the gas, map it out geophysically, and then finally, the George Mitchell that propelled this uh, uh, gas shale uh, technology into limelight. So it's, uh, I, I used to laugh, uh, John, uh, the big companies didn't know about horizontal oil drilling. My grandfather was a, was, a, was a wildcatter, and the big companies would come and they would do horizontal drilling from the acreage next door and steal my grandfather's uh, oil and gas. So, uh, if Flint Oil Company was a major today, we would surely be supporting the World Affairs Council. <laughs> the second thing we must point to, and I, uh, our colleague, uh, Ambassador Canada, free trade. The free trade agreement by Canada was, was I think, one of the most significant uh, foreign policy successes of both Canada and the United States back in 1985. I remind you, Ambassador, and I, I was with President Reagan when Brian Mulroney suggested the free trade agreement. Very important because the western provinces of Canada wanted to sell the oil and gas, but Canada also wanted to protect its sovereignty as a nation. What a success story that was. Thank you, Brian Mulroney in Canada. That became NAFTA and indeed free trade uh, uh, came around the world. Third point we did right is we fought cartels. John was absolutely right when he said OPEC. We have been, it has been a tiresome process for 40 years since the Arab oil embargo. We have turned the tide. I think OPEC. Despite going to be selling more oil, but if John's dream comes true of alternative uh, uh, fuels for transportation, OPEC is out of business. Let me also say, because Paula Dobriansky is your chair, there's no greater woman that won the Cold War than Paula, in that we fought Soviet Union. And one of the ways we won, we beat the Soviet Union is we fought their gas cartel. They were going to capture Europe. They were going to use the hard currency earnings. We stopped it, again, uh, with the benefit of Shell the troll field in the North Sea. We all agreed to develop that. Uh, so how do we keep, I might add, the technology going? Because maybe that's been the single biggest uh, impact of the last 40 years, but we didn't really know what the technology was going to be uh, to bring all these benefits. And how do we uh, continue that? Because they're all around the world now. I don't know if you remember 5% GDP was US or global, but let me say with a world of 10 billion people approaching, we want to make sure that energy is a contributor to global economic development and not a constraint. And I just really wonder if Iran isn't back at the table because they want to sell a little gas. Okay, you've got to ask that. So yes, game changer. Final point on US energy security. As I said uh, many times, as, as Ron Reagan's uh, Deputy Secretary of Energy, let's not crack it up in Washington. I mean, let's not take this great gift that has been bestowed upon the United States and globally and put silly environmental uh, standards that really have no impact. When I was growing up in Tulsa, I would go to the oil fields, I would play in the oil. We didn't really have an EPA in 1960. I'm still alive. What do you say? We play in oil, it's energy secure. And again, think of the, geo the geopolitical benefits to this country. Michael, you're more of an expert than, than me on this, but what is going to happen when the American people realize all the oil and gas from the Middle East is going to Asia? And what is China? When is China going to wake up and say, hey, the more that we you know, deal with Iran and don't put constraints on, the more we're threatening ourselves. And the final point, I'll leave you with this, because it is a broader discussion, uh, how will U.S. foreign policy change? Are we really going to retreat from the Middle East now, or do we have some responsibilities there other than oil? Because frankly speaking, I think the oil and gas game, it, we're seeing the, the end of it uh, in terms of our prosperity. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Bill, for those uh, uh, thought-provoking comments. I, I think I'd like to pick up on the one you, you, you posited about foreign policy. OPEC has come up twice now, um, and and, uh, and there is definitely a lot of focus on what this sort of unconventional oil and gas revolution in the United States means for U.S. energy security.
security, but also how, how that extrapolates into foreign policy concerns. But before, before turning to Mike, uh, who obviously does a lot of work on that topic, I, I want to focus on uh, sort of our more important foreign policy ally, I think, trading partner, Canada, um, who, you know, not only because of the energy trade relationship, but physical proximity and uh, your own abundant energy resources uh, as well is getting significantly impacted by the shifting energy landscape in the United States and, and what that has to do with Canada. I wonder if you could share some opening thoughts um, for you about the significance. Well, first of all, I've never played in oil. Uh, <laughs> but, but Manitoba's on the, uh, on the edge of the Bakken oil field, so we very much understand horizontal growth. <laughs> okay, I'm North Dakota. I'm glad to John Bowman's out of the room right now. Uh, we, uh, uh, first of all, we, we believe that the discussion on energy and climate has to be together on, uh, and environment. And we believe that it should be four elements of the vision uh, for our neighborhood of North America and, and be, uh, the opportunity is there to deliver on that vision. Number one, I, I still believe energy efficiency is the first goal for both Canada and the United States. Uh, what is uh, produced uh, in terms of light vehicle emission standards will dramatically reduce the largest uh, greenhouse gas uh, source in both of our countries. And we're actually selling more cars because they are more consumer friendly uh, in terms of affordability. Uh, number two, we believe in renewables, uh, and uh, but they have to be affordable over time. Uh, Canada now has 64% of our electricity in uh, in renewables. Uh, we define hydro uh, as renewable in the United States. They define it as renewable in Vermont. Minnesota, and maybe somewhere else, and then you know Washington, they don't define it as renewable. But we don't understand the logic of that, but that's being partisan. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but the biggest challenge on renewables is uh, the fact that we can't get decisions, and that's what is included in Canada. Uh, when I was trained to go to the transmission line in Minnesota, it was one lawyer per megawatt. Uh, <laughs> and when we were trying to build a wind source from Montana to Lethbridge, again, people that believe in wind power block the transmission line. So, uh, you know, I know we, we focus in on a pipeline, but it's a lot of energy sources uh, get stopped uh, through uh, how you get it there. What we are going to do, everybody may agree with or not agree with, but how you get there is, I think, even more complicated and slower and more uh, uh, battle of one-trick ponies than, uh, than uh, other uh, dimensions of energy and climate. Number three, I concur with everyone on gas. I've been on panels with T. Boone Pickens before I've heard this speech. He starts off a panel by saying, I'm 84 years old and, I, and I, I'm worth billions of dollars and therefore I don't give a damn what you think about me. <laughs> None of that I can say, so I didn't hear anything. But uh, it goes on about, uh, particularly the fleet vehicles uh, and trucks. There's 8 million trucks in the United States, 1 million trucks in Canada. We're certainly alerting to our government to what is the bridge to get us there on uh, the transition that might have to take place. And number four, oil in Canada, the United States and Mexico, uh, in our neighborhood again, uh, not relying on uh, the Middle East. Uh, displacing uh, the reliance in the Middle East with oil in the neighborhood. Uh, we think what's going on in Mexico with the constitutional changes are very important. We also think the changes going on in Canada are very important uh, and uh, obviously in the United States uh, are very, very important. And we think uh, we have the ability to have that oil independence in our neighborhood uh, with uh, as part of a broader vision, not as just this project against that project, this energy source against that energy source, we think it can be achieved. So that's what we're trying to work on. Uh, we think we can have cleaner air, cleaner water, and uh, energy security in this neighborhood by working together. Michael, maybe you want to pick up on that point, um, both on, on what does this mean for U.S. energy security? How do you feel like we, we sort of, um, uh, uh, where, where are we, you know, these, these sort of our own energy security, but then also how does that relate to some of the environmental goals? Sure. I think it's great that people are having conversations about 
what all these changes mean for energy security. I, I agree with part of what John said on this being underappreciated. I think as a business story, it's being told in a pretty robust way. But as a story on uh, for the broader implications, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what it means. I do think we need to be careful when we think about what this means for energy security or more generally for American security in the world. Uh, the reality is that our economy is vulnerable to volatile oil prices. When the price goes up quickly, we hurt as an economy, and because of that, we worry about all sorts of things that might happen around the world that would send the price skyrocketing. That remains true even if we were to produce all the oil that we consume. Okay, so producing more oil has economic benefits. It helps our security at the margin, but it is not a substitute for becoming less dependent as an economy on oil overall. And becoming less dependent means, in part, developing substitutes and using substitutes, but in part, using less oil for the same amount of economic output. Uh, since 2005, we've had this great boom in oil production. We've also cut our consumption by roughly as much as we increase our production. And that's also because of new opportunities presented by technology, in this case, automobile technology, helped along by high prices and by regulation that have drive consumer adoption. So I think these two pieces are, are both essential. We can come back to this broader discussion about, uh, about the Middle East, but I would just say as a marker that we still live in a globally integrated oil market. We are not going back to the late 1960s where the world trade system is much more balkanized. And because of that, uh, it's much tougher for us to extract ourselves from some of the problems uh, that, that come out of that region. On the environment and climate front, maybe a few very quick points. I think first, it's important to remember that this oil and gas boom that is driving opportunity in this country relies on public acceptance. And will continue to rely on public acceptance in new areas uh, that are not Texas, that are not Oklahoma, but that are California or New York and other places that are less naturally comfortable. And Ensuring that public acceptance requires not only substantively good regulation, but regulation and rules that people trust. And so we need to evaluate our opportunities and our options on the regulatory front, both on that substantive side, but also on uh, that public acceptance side. So it may be that the EPA uh, can do much more substantively than the state regulator, but if the EPA creates greater trust in some parts of the country, that can be substantively important to development. That's the first. Uh, second on the climate front, this gas boom gives us a real opportunity to do more to reduce our emissions. And I use the word opportunity intentionally. And there's a habit that in the public discussion about what's happening to talk about gas as something that is solving our climate problem for us without us having to put in any effort. How wonderful given how difficult all this climate change are. Uh, the reality is that if you look at projections, even with abundant natural gas, we still don't get anywhere close to where we need to be on climate. It's better to think about gas as a cheap option for reducing emissions alongside moving to zero carbon sources, but then using policy in order to get greater use of that opportunity. Uh, final point, the United States is still only a small slice of the global emissions picture. We're meeting here while the UN climate talks are underway in Poland, uh, preparing for <coughs> Uh, I hate to call it some Copenhagen, but uh, a new global discussion in 2015. Uh, the big news of the day is not a breakthrough on climate finance or international cooperation. It's that Japan has radically reversed its goal that it announced four years ago for emissions cuts and has come up with something that's uh, substantially less exciting, but probably more in line with what it can actually do. And that's a useful reminder that individual countries' capabilities and goals are going to be a lot more important than global summits as we try to sort out uh, the climate problem. Those are both very interesting angles on the, on, on the issue. I think that when we talk about sort of the, the issues of energy security and, and environmental impacts, but then also climate change, we find that the U.S. is sort of in a new strategic position where we have discovered a resource and, and proven the economic case for developing a resource that perpetuates a fossil-based energy future when, in point of fact, 
a lot of the energy policy under the current administration was very much focused on sort of navigating away from that. So we, I think we, we're doing a lot of sort of straddling between the two worlds, not quite sure which direction uh, will be headed in both in the United States and, and, uh, and globally. I, I want to take some questions from the audience, but before that I wanted to bring up one thing that nobody on the panel has, has mentioned yet, which is, um, yes, we've talked about the, the resource. Yes, we've talked about the opportunity. We've talked about technology opportunities within the realm of, of our own consumption. We've talked about generally what this might mean for foreign policy. But one very concrete way that this is uh, manifesting itself within sort of the U.S. policy debate is on exports, right? LNG exports from the United States, crude oil exports, coal exports even, whether it's on a North America basis or just out of the United States, we have policies that were enacted in the 1970s in response to an Arab oil embargo uh, type situation. 40 years hence, here we are in a position where we, we can actually export some of these, uh, these resources. Um, but there are artifacts of, uh, of, of days where we were concerned about not having enough of these resources. How important is this export discussion, both on natural gas and crude oil, I guess we want to take two of them, to this discussion about energy security. Can the United States export <coughs> some of these critical fuels and, and still be energy secure? And what does it mean in terms of how we relate to some of these other countries? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one on first. But. Well, I, I think that uh, there's an opportunity for participation in the global dynamics of back and forth, export, import. Uh, but I think there is a practical limit in terms of A, the market, what's the real export market size, B, the demand domestically within the region for U.S. production. If you start with oil, I don't think we're exporting crude oil ever because we currently import, import half of our crude oil every day. And we're not going to get to a production level that is both going to supply the U.S. fully and provide for exports on oil. The reason we won't is in the nature of shale, while I said earlier it's hugely abundant, it also has a rapid decline rate. And so when you start drilling and as you increase the amount that you're actually producing, you find yourself drilling ever more just to sustain the higher production rate. And I just don't see that reaching a level of 18 million barrels a day. We might get to 10 million barrels a day with time, but then you're drilling ever so many more wells to keep it at 10 million barrels a day in the shale formations. Natural gas is more likely to be an export market, but if we convert natural gas to a transportation fuel, we create a huge, huge internal market in the United States of cleaner, more affordable energy for transportation fuel, why wouldn't we exploit that locally rather than ship that product elsewhere around the world other than opportunistically? I think Ernie Moniz, the Secretary of Energy, is very wise in gating the export licenses. I think Senator Wyden is wise in gating these. We may get to 10 billion cubic feet a day of export permits. We're currently at seven that have been approved. But beyond that, I'd rather see it domestically taking care of America's uh, energy needs. We're already exporting finished oil products, so diesel, aviation fuel, gasoline. We're already exporting some of that, uh, but not a lot, but, but some. And so why not? I, I think it's a free market. Let's, let's do it. No, it's not. Right. You're, you're just, it should be a free market. You're contradicting yourself because you're saying let's keep it here. That suggests that we shouldn't allow the export. I say allow the export, see where it goes. Second issue on, uh, on your point about the world oil market. God, I was raised in the IEA. I spent four years there. I believe in an integrated world oil market. But are we becoming a little bit like Canada? Um, <laughs> Because I'm worried about U.S. sovereignty, Ambassador. But not, my point is, you have the Western provinces, you have the Eastern provinces, and what you have is a revenue issue within Canada when you talk about energy. As we increase our oil, own oil production and gas, aren't we really becoming a nation of producers and consumers within the United States? Yes, I care about the integrated world oil market, but frankly speaking, 
isn't the debate in the United States going to be something silly like windfall profits again, or when 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 the when Mr. Markey and company, uh, you know, in Massachusetts start getting worried about me in Oklahoma again? Uh, are we not going to have a debate about internal sharing? Now, I mean, to an extent, Michael, this is your point. Are we? actually as much dependent on the integrated oil market now because if the price goes up i get richer in oklahoma uh, you see the point and then and then uh, mr obama says i'm going to take your profits away and put it towards obamacare right i mean is that not going to be the debate in the united states so i can pick up that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you might want to have to add up that <laughs> I'm not going to talk. Right, I'm uh, I agree with almost everything that, that John said. Let me just pick up on that, on it quickly. There's a difference between wanting to have natural gas used here and blocking exports in order to try and make that happen. Uh, I think there's a plausible case to be made that if we had the right policies for transportation and the right policies for power generation that created new incentives to use natural gas here, that you can permit all the terminals you want, they still wouldn't get built. On the flip side, if we don't have those policies and we block those terminals, you're not going to see all this gas going into transport and power as a result. It's going to stay in the ground. There isn't going to be the incentive to extract it. So getting the policy lever right in order to get the right outcome is really, uh, is really important. Oh, other point, we have this narrative that's developed that uh, we were in this world of scarcity, now we're in one of abundance. That's true in some senses, but last I checked, oil is at very high prices, not just in nominal but real terms. We still import half of it, and we are still, as a result, uh, dependent on the smooth functioning of a global market uh, in order to moderate that volatility in the oil price. And so we can get in this narrow little space where we think that we are so self-sufficient that we don't need the global trading system to operate well anymore. We don't need to support it by being open to trade. But we benefit a lot from the global trading system. And we need to keep that in mind as we try to do these little targeted uh, bits on the energy front. And that's why we should allow exports without constraint. But John, you, we're alternative transportation. Why aren't the big oil companies like Shell and BP and Exxon, you're the distributors for American gasoline. So I agree we should transfer to this next fuel, as you agree, but what are your you brothers said, doing in you, this You region? said something very important a few minutes ago when you uh, talked about the independent oil guys as the innovators, the entrepreneurs. That's exactly what they are. And they will be the ones that will drive the alternative transportation. The big guys, and I speak you know, not as one of them anymore, but as having come from the industry, they have 150 refineries out there that they don't want to obsolete. They have billions and billions and billions of dollars that are basically steel in the ground to produce gasoline and diesel and aviation fuel and petrochemicals. They don't want to give that up easily, while entrepreneurs and innovators can go build steel in the ground, to build the methanol plants, to build the LNG facilities. Now, I would speak to my former employer. They are currently working on LNG projects in this country uh, to bring LNG into the United States as is Exxon and, and others. So from a natural gas standpoint, they're okay with CNG, they're okay with LNG, because that's easy to do, relatively speaking. And they're not big supporters of the methanol idea that I've been advocating, and I don't expect them to be. Just, just on that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about healthcare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> except the point I was making. <laughs> The Canadian healthcare system is at 11 point, just over 11% of GDP. The American system is a little higher. So make your investment On the issue of exports, uh, I go to the Hill a lot of, you know, uh, talk about who's going to win the Olympic gold medal on hockey or something. But we also talk about it. And, and uh, there is a huge divide, and I don't think it's partisan, between those individual elected representatives that believe it should be a completely free market, and those who believe that the development, in particular in gas, should be used as an economic advantage to turn an in-source, uh, particularly manufacturing, back to the United States, and therefore there should be a wall around exports in the States. So this is, a, this is just underneath the surface, so I would say it's like a a political iceberg. It's got about 
a little bit above the water, and it's a lot below the water. But it's very passionate, not well articulated for the public, but it's very passionate feelings on it. So that's number one. Number two, Canada has a criteria. You can't export unless you satisfy the National Energy Board that you are able to supply the domestic demands in the country. So we have a criteria. Uh, and number three, uh, for us exports now, we've had a tradition of exporting only to the United States oil. Uh, you know, going from, who would have thought going from 84 to 85 pipelines was going to be controversial between our two countries. Uh, but under the Canada US trade agreement, it wasn't, NAFTA was different because it had the Mexican issue of the constitutional authority of Pemex in their constitution, which they're now trying to amend. But there was the biggest ask from the United States is to guarantee Canada would supply uh, the United States with oil. And we had an example where, uh, this, under this treaty, that uh, Pennsylvania <coughs> gas displaced Alberta gas with, when we approved the pipeline two years ago uh, because it was closer and more affordable for consumers in Ontario who haven't yet chosen to develop their gas. This is speaking to the Canadian sovereignty. <coughs> and so uh, we, if there's going to be, in the short term, there'll be obviously uh, an economic uh, negative impact if things don't proceed as they were intended to proceed. The goalposts have changed, though. We've got two proposals to the east, one of them very clear. Both of them, I think, uh, doable. Uh, two to the west, one more controversy than the other, and two to the south. And this will change our export reality, not our export treaty. We could go on for, for a while here, but I'm conscious of the time. What I'd like to do is take two questions, and then we'll let the panelists deal with both of them. So if I have two questions from the audience, this will take uh, one over here, and then we'll do one back there. Okay. I'm Barry Boyer from, the the year, my oh, Barry Boyer from Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, as a preliminary question, is anyone on this panel scientifically qualified to explain to us uh, in an objective way the side effects environmentally of fracking? And if not, don't answer my second question. If so, answer it. What are the environmental um, implications of fracking? Okay, great. And then can we down the right over here? We'll take the questions together. I had Miles from World Boston. Um, the present Secretary of Energy, I'm sorry his name escapes me right now, gave a talk before the BC at the Boston Committee of Foreign Relations about a year and a half ago or so. The guy with the long hair. Was jealous. Um, anyways, he said that he said by the end of this decade, you know, 2018, 2019 or so, is a realistic possibility that the United States, I should say North America, would be energy independent. We will not need to import oil from them. Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and other wonderful Democrats like that. So, I mean, is that is that really is that possible? Is it? I mean, is it plausible? Great. Okay. Let's take the first one. I can take. A, I can take the first one. Look, there are a lot of environmental risks. Uh, I could give you what I think are the highlights. The first is disposal of the wastewater that comes out of these wells. So you pump a lot of water in. Uh, it is generally. Uh, well sealed underground where you're doing the fracking, but a lot of stuff comes back out and it's kind of nasty and if you don't dispose it properly, you have a problem. So that's number one. Uh, number two is you need to make sure the wells are cased properly so you don't have methane migrate from within them into uh, surrounding water supplies. Again, technically straightforward, needs to be done. Uh, three, uh, there are air quality issues around a lot of these developments where rig by rig, the impact isn't all that big of using diesel generators and having uh, ozone precursors leak and all these things, but if you have intensive development in the area, a lot of different rigs, then the cumulative impact can be substantial and you have to get on top of that. Uh, with things like making sure you don't have uh, gases leak, but also using natural gas rather than diesel as a fuel for uh, a lot of these activities. And that gets to the last point, which I think is very important. A lot of the environmental challenges associated with shale gas development are not your traditional air and water ones. They are integrating a heavy industrial activity into communities that aren't used to it. And that is, you know, the, the things you hear about truck traffic, 
but also uh, large inflows of people from uh, other parts of the country. Enormous cost inflation in some places. Uh, that's fine for people who are getting rich off what's happening, but not great for people on fixed incomes, for example. And figuring out how to handle that, that's tough. That's not something the EPA or even a state uh, environmental regulator can do. That's about zoning and about business development and about education. Uh, that's, that's possibly the most challenging environmental issue uh, that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I think Michael has teed it up very well. And, and I agree with the risks that he's identified. Uh, I just published yesterday in wallstreet.com a, a layman's explanation of fracking, comparing fracking at a drilling site to the construction of a shopping center or a building or a house, because it is a construction site. So the, the act of fracking and drilling is dirty, sloppy, messy, dangerous, all those things combined, as is a construction site where anyone is building uh, on, on nature's land. <coughs> What's critical is the effort and the process of risk mitigation. Responsible companies go beyond the regulations to deal with every issue that Michael mentioned, both in terms of introducing themselves to the community, explaining what's likely to happen, describing the effects, hiring local people, training local people, so as to import less people from elsewhere, who are also, by the way, more expensive when you think about housing them and feeding them and so forth. Uh, they do the casing, the engineering, the cementing, the water management. They do all of this to exceed the regulations so that they're not jeopardizing themselves and their future license to operate. There was a wonderful event that took place in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania last March. The Clean Air Task Force from Boston and several other environmental groups reached a voluntary agreement with five drilling companies on the golden rules of fracking. It was not a requirement, it was voluntary. But these five companies, including Chevron, by the way, including my former company, uh, along with several others, reached this voluntary agreement to go beyond Pennsylvania's regulations to make sure that they were de-risking the fracking in a state which isn't used to fracking. What I described in, in, the, in the Wall Street.com, you're taking a pipe vertically down to about, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 feet, half a mile. Then you're bending that pipe sideways for another up to 10,000 feet, or it could be deeper. It's miles long. It's a pipe, miles long. You want to make sure every part of that pipe stays intact so you don't lose any molecules. You don't lose any water. You don't create problems for yourselves. But by the time you get down there, it's only about six inches in diameter. So you're not talking about displacing a huge amount of earth. It's six, maybe at most 12 inches in diameter to actually collect the molecules. The molecules are small. You don't need a lot of pipe to collect, but it's long. But if you do the mitigation properly, I, I think that people can feel safe, they should feel safe, and companies that don't do it right, take away their license. Drive them out of the area. Don't let them operate. It's as simple as that. We've run out of time, but I would, I would like to quickly introduce you dependents in under a minute. Uh, so, <laughs> 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yes. That's the end of my comment. <laughs> and one last comment, because we haven't mentioned it. We mentioned clean fuels, but I've been chairing this nuclear committee of the DOE for 10 years. Nuclear is 20% of our electricity. That is one of the contributors to clean fuels and also energy security. And coal, given the new constraints on coal in the United States, that's a good export market for us. So yet, yeah, net energy independence, absolutely. And, and maybe just a, a, a parting thought and, and an ability for a last comment. Every extrapolation of potential energy independence scenario I've seen includes Canada with the United States. Is that true enough? Yes, we, uh, <laughs> we consider ourselves a, a, in the neighborhood as opposed to a foreign country. Uh, but not part of it. Uh, that's right. <laughs> We're not part of it. So, uh, uh, but uh, we, uh, we consider ourselves in the neighborhood, and we think in the neighborhood includes Mexico. 
Uh, and uh, there was a good meeting uh, with the president. The president was wrong. We're going to have another day soon with the three amigos, as we call them, uh, in, in our neighborhood. But we, uh, we think the what we can do is how we do it. And I mentioned transmission lines and other things in clean energy. I know the discussion is always about uh, oil and gas, but it's also renewables. Everybody wants renewables, but just nobody will agree to how to get that from where it's produced and where it's consumed. And that's also a huge challenge in our neighborhood for three countries. Uh, but we very much want to be part of the energy independence uh, in our neighborhood. We're ready, willing, and able. <laughs> uh, 